one. Here's a question for you. Why should we care about Christian unity? Well, the answer is quite simple. Jesus himself prayed for unity, asking the Father in the Gospel of John that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, these clear words of Jesus are the basis and driving force of all efforts at Christian unity and also reveal to us starkly quite how much of a scandal Christian disunity is because it contravenes, contravenes the explicit will of Christ. So, seeking the unity of Christians is an important concern. However, since the Second Vatican Council, or Vatican II, in the 1960s, the term ecumenism has become something of a buzzword. These days, we're all supposed to be ecumenical and think ecumenically. Yet, precisely because of this, the word ecumenism is just as easily used as an excuse or a get-out clause, if it means anything at all, because people don't really understand it. Historically, the Catholic understanding of ecumenism was and has been termed an ecumenism of return. That is to say that the only goal of an ecumenical dialogue is to convert people back to Rome. However, at Vatican II, a new ecclesiology or theological understanding of what the Church is was articulated, which focused first and foremost on what unites Christians who share a common baptism rather than what separates them. The Council document, Lumen Gentium, stated that while the sole Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church, there are nevertheless many elements of sanctification and truth found outside its visible confines. At once, the Church embarked on a number of official ecumenical dialogues with other Christian communities. Yet, despite these dialogues, institutional unity, at least with Protestant communities, is further away than ever. The late Cardinal Murphy O'Connor once said, that ecumenism is like a road with no exit. Yet, is this road actually leading anywhere, or is it going round in circles? Pope Benedict XVI was surely much more realistic when he acknowledged that we are not going to bring about full unity in the foreseeable future, but that the goal of ecumenism should rather be bearing witness together to Christ in the modern world. And we can all see that the secular West needs this witness more than ever. Yet, faced with a lack of progress at the institutional level, there has been more locally what might be term, termed a false ecumenism, which is characterised by a desire to remove any perceived stumbling blocks to full union with other Christians. Many have believed that in order for ecumenism to be successful, it must involve the stripping of Christianity down to what are considered its bare essentials on which we can all agree, such as the authority of the Bible, the meaning of the cross, almost as if Protestant Christianity represents a purer form of our religion. Yet, for Catholics, there is surely a great danger here, because the Pope, the sacraments, Mary, the saints and all the other distinctively Catholic things are not add-on extras to be regarded almost as bargaining chips in ecumenical endeavours. Instead, they are fundamental elements of our faith as Catholics, which, after all, were questioned by almost no one for the first three quarters of Christian history. What lies behind the rise of this false ecumenism? I'd like to suggest that many people who are confused by the new ecumenical emphasis at Vatican II, thinking that the traditional teaching on the nature of the Church had changed so that all Christians and churches were fundamentally the same, but separated only by differences in tradition or usage. One example of this is when people speak not about being a member of the Catholic Church, but about being a Christian in the Catholic tradition, as if Catholicism were just one tradition among many equally valid other traditions. But this 
is not Catholic teaching. The Catholic Church is different from any other denomination. To quote from Vatican II's decree on ecumenism, it says, Our separated sisters and brothers, whether considered as individuals or as communities and churches, are not blessed with that unity which Jesus Christ wished to bestow on those to whom he has given new birth into one body. For it is through the Catholic Church alone, which is the universal help towards salvation, that the fullness of the means of salvation can only be obtained. What then of so-called ecumenism of return or conversion? To deny the validity of conversion is the classic implication of false ecumenism based on a false ecclesiology. As Catholics, we must recognise the God-given gifts in other Christian communities and even in other religions, but maintain the traditional teaching that there is one Catholic and apostolic church with a unique mission and that this is, in a very real sense, the visible Catholic Church as we understand it in communion with the successor of St. Peter. So, ecumenism is good and necessary if its goal is to provide a common witness to Christ, but it's false when it denies fundamentals of the Catholic faith. To conclude, I would like to quote Bishop Patrick O'Donoghue, who retired as Bishop of Lancaster in 2009. Now in an interview with a Catholic news, news agency he said it's time we admitted that a wrong type of ecumenism has put a break on the Catholic Church's freedom to engage in evangelization and mission in society. It's as if our fear of offending other Christians has inhibit, inhibited us from confidently proclaiming the distinctive and defining truths of Catholicism. The bishop continued, Our goal should always be to strengthen the imperfect communion that already exists in the hope that non-Catholics will come to see and come to seek the fullness of truth. Thank you for listening and God bless you all. Oh